Hello, and welcome to What's the Word, an electrical industry podcast. I'm Jason Cox. And I'm Zach Hartle. We're thrilled to have you here today as we have another relevant conversation with someone from the electrical industry. On this episode, we're speaking with Adam Ganny, Chief Electrical Inspector for the City of Calgary. We'll be talking about code interpretations, adoption of the 25th edition of the code, conductor color coding, and more. So have a listen. Welcome to the show, Adam. Hey, good afternoon, Jason and Zach. How are you guys today? Hey, doing great. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we're going to start off here, Adam, and can you just kind of give us a quick two minutes about your professional path and your background into uh, becoming the chief electrical inspector for the city of Calgary? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Jason. So um, I was an electrician right out of high school. Uh, I worked in a number of industries, uh, residential, uh, commercial and service work. I also worked a number of uh, years in the oil sands. And I took my master electrician training with SAIT. And um, I, while I was working in the oil sands, I wanted to be home um, more. Because uh, as as you know, out of town work can be can be hard on a guy. So I um, I did my safety codes officer um, certification when I was when I was working out of town, and then I I applied with the city and ultimately um, got the uh, job as a safety codes officer, and um, I've been with the city for 14 years now, and in my in my 14 years I've worked as a safety codes officer, senior safety codes officer. Um, supervisor and now the chief uh, for the for the last three years. So can you kind of tell us a little bit about those different levels of uh, the safety inspector, uh, maybe some of the different p- descriptions and maybe some of those specific tasks and jobs? Yeah, no, absolutely. So our, our base level position is a safety codes officer and they, they conduct field inspections. Um, we also have a, uh, a phone we, we man and that's called the technical assistance center. So they, they answer uh, code questions and permitting questions um, to customers uh, when they receive those calls. And we have another role within our section that does plans examination. So we do have um, we do cursory reviews on um, um, electrical services that are 600 amps or larger or uh, over uh, 600 volts, so high voltage services, uh, and solar PV installations, um, underground installations that are one and, and larger. Um, so that's that's those are the roles done. Those are the jobs done by the safety codes officers, and then. Um, in more of a leadership role is the senior safety codes officer. So they provide leadership and mentoring to the safety codes officers, and they generally um, will work on more complex jobs um, that, that come in or they, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll help safety codes officers uh, with those more complex jobs. Uh, so with that technical assistance center, I think that's somebody that maybe not everybody knows about. So maybe we could stop there for a sec. How could uh, contractors working out in the field, contact the technical assistance center and get some help with questions they have. Yeah. So if you're a contractor and you're working in the city of Calgary under permit, um, you can call 311 and ask to speak to to the technical assistance center and um, through the technical assistance center, uh, we handle questions on, of course, electrical um, building questions, whether it's residential or commercial building questions, plumbing and gas, and also development questions. Now that you're more of a leadership role, you're not the one out there doing so many of the field inspections, but what are some of the inspections mistakes or code uh, misinterpretations that you're getting come back to you from the field? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, Zach. Um, so a couple items. Uh, so overhead services uh, in the Canadian, Canadian electrical code, um, they're required to have a rigid steel mast of um, which is trade size 63. So that's a fairly large rigid steel mast. Now there is a variance in the uh, in the stand data with, and it's a variance two rule uh, 6112, which is which allows us to install um, smaller conduit sizes, but the specific requirements that are set out in the variance have to be followed. Um, so, for example, inch and a quarter is is only so high above the roof line, 
Um, you now, if we have to go higher than that, then of course we have to go up in conduit sizes. Um, sometimes we see, you know, inch and a quarter um, ran like quite a bit higher than what's allowed in the variance, and then like they'll they'll guy wire um, the the um, the conduit back to the roof line, which of course, as we know, isn't isn't really covered in the variance. Um, so if we're going to reduce the uh, rigid steel mass size that that is allowed in the standata, um, we need to follow the very specific requirements that are laid out in the standata. So yeah, so that's one item. Um, and then the other item is underground installations. Um, so rule 12-012. Uh, so just make sure that we're we're following the the specific requirements in 12-012. And you know, like say when we're installing a tech cable, we're not installing it in a trench like that's full of large rocks or construction debris that can that can um, damage that cable. And also um, pay attention to the depths that we're installing those uh, those those raceway systems or or cables at. And also. Um, that if we are going to reduce the depth, because 12-012 allows you to reduce the depth, if, if certain mechanical um, requirements are met, so we have we follow those me me mechanical requirements, mechanical protection requirements, and um, and then last is uh, marking tape is required as as per the rule. So we we often see that there's there's no marking tape um, in the in the trench. And um, and then the last thing I'll I'll mention is uh, load calculations. Um, so not completing a load calculation. Um, say we're adding you know supplementary loads to a to an electrical service, whether it be an air conditioning unit, a hot tub, EV charger, uh, secondary suite with a lot of electric heat. Um, just ensuring that we're always doing that load calculation before we add those loads and we're not going to overload like a hundred amp service. Um, what we're seeing is um, our safety codes officers are requesting a load calculation and it, it hasn't even been done. And then uh, um, which can, you know, once it's completed, if you're over the size of the electrical service, then you're looking at a service upgrade, which could be kind of costly to, to find out uh, later on. Right. So you want to know that upfront. Yeah, service upgrade will definitely increase the price of your hot tub by quite a bit if you're adding one in. So, uh, I got a quick question here. If we were to go back to the overhead services we were speaking about a moment ago, uh, so you mentioned the trade size 63. However, um, the possibility of reducing the size of that conduit, should the contractor be consulting? with just the stand data or would it be a good idea for him to also just contact your uh, your tech center and, and speak with a safety codes officer yeah so i always i always recommend like the code um the minimum ce code requirements are are what's law in alberta and uh, and calgary um so i always refer to the rules in the ce code and then um in calgary if there is a stand data published we follow the stand data um so then refer to the stand data. And if, if, if there's still questions, if you're, if you're unsure, um, it's always good to ask for permission rather than forgiveness. Um, you can always, at that point, you can always um, phone through and ask, and ask to speak to the technical assistance center. One of the things that we have had a conversation with recently about is um, the use of the orange, brown, yellow conductors out in the field for 347, 600. Now, we know, I mean, all of us know sitting here that the code doesn't specifically allow orange, brown, yellow for those different voltages, um, but it's a common code practice or sorry, a common field installation practice. What are you guys seeing with that? And is there any change happening with that? As you, as you pointed out, uh, Zach, for some time now, um, it's been trade practice in Alberta to use um, orange, brown, yellow to identify different slash voltages in a facility that has more than one slash voltage. So 347, 600 or 277, 480. Um, but as far as we know, that has never been written into the code. We've done some review on this and we've never been able to find it in the code. Um, so, now, so now since the, the CE code is the minimum standard and minimum requirement um, in Alberta by law, um, we are going back to what with with what the code is written, and so Rule 4032 
um, specifically talks about red, black, blue for all for identification of all slash voltages. And there's other parts of the rule too that, but nowhere in that rule uh, is it written that. Uh, OBY can be used or orange, brown, yellow can be used to identify slash voltages. And then moreover, um, slash volt, uh, red, orange, brown, yellow, sorry, is to be used um, for isolated systems in patient care areas as per rule 24-208. And so we really, we really want to get back to the minimum requirements of what the code is saying and requires. And so it's, it's expected that if uh, there's an installation um, happening in the city of Calgary uh, that, you know, the raceway systems or um, the junction box covers and, and panel covers and ways into that system are correctly identified with the voltages that are contained within. Okay, so I have a question on that and I think you may have answered it, but you'll maybe just give me some clarification here. So I've worked in dozens of high rises in downtown Calgary, where the slash voltage 277, 480, or more commonly 347, 600, is used to supply lighting to, to floors, entire floor spaces, or maybe multiple floor spaces. So with the city now really just trying to work now with red, black, blue, in my existing system, if I was to do a reno on a floor that in the past was all fed with orange, brown, yellow feeding lamps, uh, but now we're going to LEDs or some other efficiency lighting situation, um, how am I, can I have red, black, blue in the same conduit, pardon me, in the same junction box as existing orange, brown, yellow feeding that new retrofit yeah these are very it's a very good question so we've we've come up with three scenarios that mostly cover different installations if it's a brand new installation um it should meet the requirements of the code bottom line and if if it's a situation where um like say say there's a 347 600 volt lighting panel that's on a floor as you identified and all the existing wiring is being removed back to the panel, um, then all new wiring that, that's to go to the panel should be red, black, blue for that 347, 600 volt lighting and power. Um, now, sometimes in, in high rises, um, a 347, 600 volt panel could serve a few different floors. Now, if you're just doing a renovation on um, the one floor, so it's a tenant improvement, um, and there is that, you know, there's that three-phase uh, four-wire circuit brought out on the floor, it's orange, brown, yellow. Um, I would say that that would be carried on with orange, brown, yellow. Uh, the last thing we want to do is to create a situation where we're identifying with two different colors now. That wouldn't be, that would not be good. So um, those are those are generally the three scenarios. Uh, but what I do recommend, uh, if you're starting a project and you're unsure, uh, please contact us, um, technical assistance center. Um, you know you're starting you're starting the rough the rough walls in the in the space and, and you're wondering um, what to do with that lighting circuit. Get get us there for uh, for that initial rough inspection and and uh, go over with the safety codes officer on on what you want to do for the for the lighting circuits. And um, we can provide that advice at that time. It's amazing just to think, I mean, I have been out of like the field construction for 15 years now, but with, with the introduction now of LEDs, which were introduced a while ago, right? Those giant 347 volt, 600 volt uh, panels that we used to feed all the lighting with now, I mean, they're almost obsolete. <laughs> yeah, you could... You know, one 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 four wire circuit could do an entire floor now with uh, with the efficiency of that lighting. Uh, so, in terms of maybe punitive measures for not following, you know, permitting requirements or permitting processes, what can contractors or homeowners expect to see? Yeah, so a very good question. Um, permits are required under under the act, and um, and so all construction. Um, alterations, additions, uh, new construction uh, requires to be permitted. And so um, 
you know, when, when there is non-code compliance or an unsafe condition that's identified by a safety codes officer, um, they will write a notice um, with their with their requirements um, to to bring it up to code compliance or, or safety. And if um, if those requirements are are not met, um, one vehicle to compliance is uh, is an order under under the Safety Codes Act. Um, now, generally the timelines of an order are like 35 days. It's it's a legal it's a legal order to comply. It can be less depending on the situation. And and if and if that fails, then there can be charges under the Safety Codes Act um, for for non compliance or or not obtaining an electrical permit. Um, but uh, but generally, yes, uh, that we 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 do want to see um, permits obtained in the city of Calgary, and um, you know it's it's ultimately the owner's responsibility to ensure that permits are in, are obtained um, for the work that's that's being completed. Adam, one thing I've noticed over the last couple. I guess years, maybe decade, is that the the permitting process for both homeowners and contractors is becoming easier. So obviously we have technology now that's helping that along, but would you say that that's a goal of the inspections department is to make that process easy and attainable for everyone to get a permit? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, Absolutely. I think it's a corporate push to actually make online services uh, more accessible. Uh, we have we have moved a lot of things online, and um, it, granted, permitting was online before COVID, um, but you know we, it, it will get easier um, to do this stuff online. Now, for electrical contractors, permits are instant release, and so regardless of what you're doing, um, you you can pull a permit through currently the Vista system. And that's instant re- release. There may be some plans examination requirements, but those can come in after after the permits pulled. And um, homeowners can also pull permits online um, through the My ID um, piece once they once they um, create that My ID. Uh, pretty soon, uh, it's a little forward looking, but but we are doing a project to create My Business ID. So the same sort of thing that homeowners have right now, but for businesses. Um, and that'll that'll replace the the Vista ID um, for pulling permits. Um, but we are uh, we are constantly trying to improve our online services um, for customers. Well, and there's no question that improving that system, and I think specifically in my opinion, like getting homeowners the ability to pull permits and get an inspection is going to create better basement rough-ins and better installations from the homeowner and hopefully they see that process is easy and they're not avoiding it because of difficulty. Right. And I have heard that has been getting better. And um, speaking of homeowners versus contractors permits, maybe for a minute, what would be the difference between a homeowner's permit and a contractor's permit in terms of inspections? What's the difference there? Yeah. So um, to obtain a homeowner's permit, you have to own and uh, reside in the home and you, you, you should have, you know, a basic knowledge of wiring and be competent um, to do that wiring. Uh, we also restrict what homeowners can pull permits for. So homeowners cannot pull permits for electrical service work. Um, they can tie into the brand circuit wiring compartment of a panel, um, but they can't do anything upstream of that. Um, they also cannot do solar PV installations um, because of the complexity, and they can't do in-ground swimming pools because of the complexity of those systems as well, like the bonding and grounding requirements. And then homeowners, we have to be able to see all of the wiring. Um, so it, none of the wiring can be um, buried at time of inspection uh, and it can't be covered by dr- uh, drywall or any sort of finishing material or insulation or vapor barrier. So we wanna be able to access like all the wiring, um, all of the splices. And uh, so it's, it's quite a rigorous, um, it's quite a rigorous inspection. Uh, homeowners are slight, or sorry, contractors are slightly different, um, depending on uh, where where the inspection is taking place and the, and the job value. Um, so we do have a quality management plan that uh, that has those requirements set out in uh, in in the quality management plan. Adam, with the inspections during COVID, um, I I understand that you guys were doing some video inspections. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's uh, that is correct, um, Jason. We uh, we were able to very quickly pivot, um, and we were given permission um, by the province to pivot to um, to video inspections to keep construction going. And um, so we were doing remote video inspections uh, using the Google Duo um, app. And um, that allowed us to keep uh, our workers and, um, and then the public safe. You can imagine on, on a daily basis, we do 600 or so inspections, not, not just electrical, but you know, I'm, thinking of, um, I'm thinking of electrical, plumbing, gas, building, could be even more in some cases and development inspections, I should add to that too. And so we were using um, this to, to, to try to reduce the, the touch points that, that, that we could have on a daily basis. Um, we were using that for occupied residential, like, so that's your basement development and, and, um, and general renovation work. Um, and then for some commercial installations as well, um, really where um, safety codes officers saw an opportunity to use a video inspection um, to, to reduce uh, the amount of contact they, they would have with the public. Um, so it, it's, it's been helpful in, in helping us keep our staff and, uh, and the public safe during the pandemic. So yes, and of course, during the pandemic, right, we've all been forced to, uh, to take on these new challenges of new uses for technology. For some of us, it's been daunting for others. They, they, they embrace it and have been using it for years. Um, so coming out of COVID, if, if that was to happen soon, I cross my fingers, uh, it seems like these video inspections would be something that might continue. Yes, uh, I I don't, I see us using video inspections in, into the future, so I don't see them going anywhere. It's just, it may look different on how we, how we uh, do our video inspections and where we use those, those video inspections. Um, we have, we have realized some efficiencies, um, but we, we do want to use those video inspections uh, for where they're appropriate. Um, like for example, the homeowner it permits, uh, we definitely want to do a site visit on the, on the homeowner piece. Um, it's just, it's more of a comprehensive inspection when you're there in, in person on site and able to do that inspection, um, as opposed to over, over video. So, um, we're still, we're still working out the details on what that looks like for the future. Um, but that's one of our projects. When your contractors are calling into your technical assistance center, uh, do they have the ability to send you guys video and or pictures of things that they're they're having questions with? Yeah, we uh, we definitely use all those forms of communication with our customers, um, but it, it's very scenario scenario specific. So uh, it's it's really up to the safety codes officer uh, whether you know they 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 accept or communicate using picture or video. So Adam, inspection department, they collaborate with the contractors, the electrical contractors. I imagine there's also some collaboration with NMAX and I know maybe all three of them work together, contractor NMAX and inspections. Um, the, the situation that comes to mind for me, I guess, would be in Calgary here. We're seeing a lot of infill houses come in where maybe a single family home that has probably a 100 amp, maybe even a 60 amp service come down. And in its place goes up a fourplex. So you're quadrupling the load or more with air conditioners and all that probably going in the new houses. How does that relationship between NMAX contractor and inspections work? The city of Calgary electrical inspection um, are, we're the authority having jurisdiction under part one of the Canadian electrical code. And then there is a demarcation point. Um, at some point, depending on if it's an overhead or underground service. So when we, we think about overhead, so we think about overhead services in say the inner city, um, the demarcation point would be the weatherhead, um, for example. And MX is responsible to connect that electrical service uh, with their with their overhead wiring or their, the triplex. Um, now, as under part one of the Canadian Electrical Code, um, if we're taking down um, a single family dwelling and, and we're putting up, uh, you know, a, a duplex or fourplex or whatever the case may be. Of course, we would, we would, we would do a demand on the service calculation to ensure that we can adequately uh, service the new development. And then um, we, 
the city of Calgary electrical inspection doesn't tie in with MMAX to ensure that MMAX can can service um, that new development. It's actually up to the the customer, the electrical contractor, uh, to get a hold of MMAX, and they can do that um, by emailing getconnected at mmax.com, and um, that's an MMAX. Um, you know, will 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 ensure that they can they can correctly service that um, that that new development. So, in a situation such as that, uh, demarcation point, just to be clear, is where essentially NMAX's responsibility would end from their conductor, and it becomes the homeowners or the consumer service would take place. Okay, so in an underground situation, that would happen at the meter base. No. Um, okay. That's a very good question. In the city of Calgary, um, for underground services, demarcation is actually the property line. So it's not a point of connection, um, which is, which is, which is unique. Okay. Um, so yeah. And then for overhead services, it's, it's the weatherhead. So, uh, just to reiterate that, um, for underground services, it's a property line and then, um, overhead services, it's the weatherhead. Okay. Great. And then in a situation like that, you mentioned contractor contacts NMAX, get connected at nmax.com just to ensure that they are okay to install a larger um, demand at that point, the utility grid can support it. Would they need to submit prints to the city inspection department? When are prints required to be submitted? Yeah, so we do plans examination uh, for electrical services that are 600 amps or larger and uh, commercial. Um, we don't, there are some, there are a few electrical services that are residential in the city of Calgary that are actually 600 amps or larger, but we don't require prints um, for that. Um, and then we do require prints uh, for solar PV, all solar PV installations at this time. And um, we reserve the right to um, request prints for um, complex installations. So if, if there's something we've never seen before, or um, it's it's fairly complex, and we want information up front to you know to to, to review and then compile for the safety codes officer who's going to go there on site, we can request that. Um, and underground installations, one ought and larger, to meet the. Uh, to meet the section four underground requirements uh, or the IEEE 835. Um, we wanna know upfront that, you know, we're either installing to the prescriptive requirements in section four, or if there's a calculation being done to the standard, to the IEEE 835 underground standard. And so once we, um, once we get all that information, uh, we review it and then we um, attach it to the permit and the safety codes officer can go out and do their inspection based on, on what's compiled there. All right. So a question that just kind of popped into my head here that we probably should have covered earlier on when we're looking at permitting, we always have questions about fire alarm systems. So do you need a building permit and the fire alarm permit, pardon me, an electrical permit? When do you need both? When do you need one? Can I call the technical assistance center? And basically Adam, how does all that work? Yeah, so generally, if we're doing any sort of fire alarm work, we're going to need both a building permit and an electrical permit. Um, there are very few scenarios where you may only need an electrical permit. Um, so what I recommend, as, as you pointed out, um, if you're unsure, please call the Technical Assistance Centre and ask to speak to a building SEO and they can, they can, they, they can discuss your specific uh, scenario with you and um, advise you on which permits are required. The 2021 Canadian Electrical Code comes into adoption in Alberta, February 1st of 2022. Adam, is there some changes to that electrical code that you'd like to kind of mention? Yeah, so the biggest change um, in the 25th edition is the deletion of Table 39. And so now <clears throat> for, for residential services, uh, you would select a conductor from table two or four. Um, and so that's, that's a major change. And um, we're, we're currently working with MMAX uh, on what that looks like. Because with the deep service program, um, they generally supply number two aluminum USCB90 or four-aught aluminum USCB90. 
um, to to single family dwellings and new subdivisions. Uh, so that's you know it's a major change, and to go to go up um, to bigger conductor sizes is is going to be quite quite an issue. Uh, so we're working through that challenge right now. I don't have a lot of details for you guys, but I want to come back with that. Um, for overhead services, like if we're doing a service upgrade um, in inner city, it's generally easier because the electrician can just select what, what conductor is they're going to install as per table two and four, and then they can go up in size because the weather head is the utility demarcation point. And so NMAX can still keep their um, triplex sizing uh, because that's under their utility code. So that's under part three or the Alberta utility code. Um, so that's the biggest change uh, for, for the 2021, 25th edition Canadian Logical Code. And um, I will certainly keep you guys posted on, on how that, on, on all the details and, and what that looks like for the future. Okay, and that's great. Thank you so much for that. What I'd also like to just clarify right now is you guys will be inspecting based on the 25th edition of the code when the permit is pulled after February 1st, is that correct? That's correct, yep. Okay. Adam, that's, um, that's great. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us about um, everything we've chatted about today with inspections. Um, like you mentioned, we're going to hold you to that and we're going to bring you back for a follow-up in probably around February or something to see what the plan is with underground services. Um, but I truly do appreciate your time and thanks for coming on the show today. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, Zach. Appreciate, appreciate you having me on the show. Very appreciative today to have Adam on the show, uh, to have an hour of his time to talk to us about just the processes and the procedures and what the inspection department's like. Definitely, we get asked questions about uh, strange situations all the time when it comes to the code. And it was nice to talk to an inspector and get his feedback on that. What do you think, Zach? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, like you say, I really appreciate the time from Adam and just having that time with any inspector. I mean, they have such a wealth of knowledge where they're going out and they're seeing so many different installations. Um, and I love that he pointed out the, the technical assistance center, um, right? Making those inspectors available to people doing the installations in the field. So definitely an asset that, I mean, hopefully someone learned about that today and can use them moving forward. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Like a lot of times when we're looking at those weird code situations, now it's just going to be simply call your safety codes officer, call 311, talk to someone in the technical assistance center. Hey, if it's fire alarm, you might have questions about building permits and electrical permits. So, so great, uh, great topic of conversation there today. What was a big takeaway for you? Well, the orange, brown, yellow, of course, we talked about it and I remember kind of looking at it, like shaking my head the first time I started pulling orange, brown, yellow 20 plus years ago. So it'll be interesting to see in the months that come how that's adopted in the industry. Uh, if everyone just quickly abandons orange, brown, yellow, or if they keep pulling it because they weren't aware of the change. Um, so it'll be neat to see how that comes about. It, it does make sense. And it would be nice to have some sort of consistency throughout our trade not just in our city but obviously throughout the nation yeah it's one of those interesting trade practice conversations i mean technically nothing's changing now we're just following the code as it has always been written but yeah, i remember being an apprentice and for years pulling a couple of years pulling orange brown yellow only to go to school to find out well that's not right to then go back to site to be like oh no we always pull orange brown yellow so yeah it's an interesting uh, application now and trying to follow the wording of the CE code. So it's good to see. Yeah. And I mean, truthfully now, back in my day, we had giant 347 slash 600 volt lighting panels and those panels might not be used hardly at all anymore, at least to the full capacity they were in the past, just because of the changes in led lighting. So, yeah. So we continue to learn and we'll uh, look forward to talking to Adam, hopefully in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just also a big shout out to the city of Calgary as a whole. They were 
very easy to deal with to facilitate the recording of this podcast. And we do appreciate that, that openness and that willingness to come on the show. Um, and of course, also thanks to all of our listeners who are here listening to this show. Jason and I are here trying to bring relevant conversations and, and we'd love to hear from you. We want to know what you want to hear about. Uh, please reach out to us, Facebook, Instagram, let us know what you want to hear about on the show. You can connect with both of us on LinkedIn if you want. Uh, and please make sure you're subscribed, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts and tell your friends to get the word out there. Just remember, this isn't a race to the bottom. It's a race to the top. Make sure you pull your permits and work safe and we'll see you guys on the next episode.